Dr. Annette Dunham is a lecturer at the School of Psychology and Faculty of Health at Deakin University. Annette has uh, lectured and studied organisational psychology, both um, internationally and nationally, and has a strong interest in career and professional development, mentoring in networks and in organisations. So today Annette is going to talk to us about the role of leadership in rural communities. And I think this follows on quite nicely from what Deb has just presented. So put your hands together for Annette. Thank you. Hello, so there's one thing to get out of the way before we start and I have got an accent from over the ditch. Okay, so you've, you've got that. And there'll be no talk of upcoming cricket games. All right, that's just off the cards. It's my very great pleasure to be able to talk um, here today at Marcus Oldham. I have to confess to being a small town girl, so I'm not, I wasn't brought up on farm, but uh, I've always been part of small towns that have been very closely connected to rural business. And so it's something that, I, that I've known something about. And my first job here in Australia four years ago was as a, um, Director of Education and Training for Allied Health Professionals who were around rural and regional Australia. So I got to see, uh, sorry, Victoria. So I got to see a lot of Victoria and I got to see a lot of, of the issues that they were dealing with as well. So I want to start today by asking how many leaders are here today? Put up your hands if you're a leader. Yes, great, I see those hands. <laughs> it's good to see those hands, but I, I actually fear some of you have been quite shy because I think that the number of leaders here is a lot more than that. Because if you're here, then you're learning. And if you're here, you actually care about something going into, you've got goals, you've got something. And people look up to people that have goals and are trying to do something with their lives. So I think probably, all of you have the capacity to be leaders. And I'm not just talking big political leaders or big organisational leaders or even business leaders. Sometimes it's a leader in a family. Sometimes it's in a small group of friends. A leader is someone who someone else follows. That's the essence of it. I'm glad we've had that, our last speaker talking so much about the power of stories. I want to share a story of my own. Um, the story is about a time that I was taking an afternoon, afternoon drive with a couple of members of my extended family. And we were out in the countryside and we'd pull, pulled over for just a short stop just to stretch our legs and have a look around at what was around us. And I'd wandered across the road. Um, something over there looked pretty interesting. So I was there and as I was looking, I heard a, a really a growing sound that sounded like quite a roar happening. And I turned around to see behind me a truck that had taken a corner way too quickly. I knew that that truck was in trouble. And what's more, I knew that my family, who were actually standing by the car on the other side of the road, were also in trouble because that car had them in, in its sights. I, I remember sitting there and think, uh, standing there and thinking, I've got to do something. So I shouted, at least I tried to shout but it was that most helpless feeling of opening your mouth and nothing coming out. And then I woke up, <laughs> thankfully, to find that it had been a dream and I was just so relieved except the roar hadn't stopped. It was 4.35am on Saturday the 5th of September 2010 and a 7.1 earthquake had just hit the area that I lived in. And my life and the life of many people around me changed from that day. Things went so bad in that first earthquake in Christchurch because um, there were no fatalities and everybody was just going around saying, isn't this amazing? We've had so much damage but no fatalities. Fantastic. I was sitting in Canberra Airport, of all things, on 10.50am on the 22nd of February 2011. And I was sitting in that lounge and there was a TV screen above me and all of a sudden I heard, I don't know, I hadn't really been following what was on there, but there was a news presenter and she said, we've just had word in the last 15 minutes of a devastating earthquake that's hit Christchurch. 
And I was sitting there because I'd been out of the country for 48 hours. That earthquake waited till I was out of the country for 48 hours. And I was about to fly back into Christchurch that day via Sydney. I can't rem remember a lot of that day, except I learnt a little bit about the kindness of strangers and the breaks that you have. Suddenly, um, I was able to get on a, a flight going into um, Wellington because there are no flights going into Christchurch. I got to Wellington Airport. I didn't have a phone. Someone lent me their phone so I could actually find out if my family were OK. And they were. They were fine. Um, and then I was very lucky that a couple of... Go um, there was nowhere to stay in Wellington because all the, all the hotel rooms were taken by people who, who had been disrupted by the earthquake. So a group of us had to actually just stay overnight in the Wellington airport and I was grateful for two guys who were just surfing the internet looking for any flights that were going to be going into Christchurch. And I finally got a, a flight and I got the second commercial flight into Christchurch the, the next day. There, the airport was absolutely full of people trying to get out and I was trying to get in. Uh, the first thing I did, my husband picked me up at the airport and we took a journey and we went around and we visited family because that's what you do. You want to make sure your family are okay. So we did that and then um, we went home and then the next day friends of ours rang and, and these friends own a juice bottling plant. And that means they've got access to a water tanker. Isn't that great? They have access to a water tanker. They said, we're going to go into Christchurch. We're going to set up and we're just going to dispense water for those who need it. Do you want to come and help? So I said, yep, we'll go and we'll, we'll help. So what we did is we set up shop at a, a, a car park beside a sports ground in one of the worst affected areas of Christchurch. And we dispensed water, but we didn't just dispense water. Actually, most of what we did, I think, was listen. We listened to the stories of people who'd been really affected by this earthquake. And there were lots of stories to be told. It was just the most amazing day. And we felt really privileged to be in a position to be able to help those people. But we even had people coming to us to help us help those people. So we had people driving around who were bringing cups of tea. Cups of tea taste really good in a crisis. They really get you through. Before too long, we had army trucks turn up with, with food to be distributed. And they said, looks like something's happening here. We're going to make this a welfare centre. So our, our little water dispensing thing became a bit of a welfare centre. Before too long, we actually had a helicopter landing in the car park as well, again with food to be distributed. It was an amazing, amazing experience to have. Um, and it's really the experience that's listed here on the first phase of a, of a reaction or response to a crisis. Um, these four phases were reported um, in a document by Sir Peter Gleichmann to the New Zealand government talking about the psychosocial um, recovery of Christchurch after the earthquakes. And they talk about an initial phase where people really help and they don't count the cost. And I was really fortunate to see that and be a part of that. And I understood just the, the sheer energy that comes when people work together like that. I have to say that the next time I, I actually helped with the water dispensing uh, exercise was five days later. And there was a difference already. People were really starting to get annoyed. People were starting to get really fidgety because things weren't really happening. They were still living in houses without water. They were still living in circumstances that were beyond them, and they are still coping with the ongoing aftershocks that were still rippling through. They had no chance to get over um, the fear that, that that rumbling noise, that truck I'd had in my dream, brought for them. I don't know. I think when I look at media reports of tragedies and, and, and disasters that happen, I think we often hear media calling that first response to a tragedy as resilience. They call that first response resilience, and I'm, I really question that now from my own experience. I go back to Christchurch, I still have family there, I still have interests there, and what I see now is a lot of people that are very frustrated. I see some really good spirit too. I see pop-up container shops. Who knew that could be a thing? But it's a thing. And it works really well, but there are also pop-up um, roadworks everywhere. It takes so much longer than you ever think it's going to take to get anywhere. And there's real frustrations, and there's people who drive like they're cowboys and cowgirls because just the frustration's getting to them.
I took this photo actually in Victoria Square um, a while ago in Christchurch, and the reason I took it is that Christchurch is known as the Garden City. I know there's probably a lot of other cities that are known as the Garden City as well, but it's the Garden City. But it's a new reality now, and the new reality is it's still the Garden City, but there are an awful lot of ruins in behind it. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of gaps where houses and buildings used to be. And there's even parklands now where whole communities used to live. But it, it looks, it's really weird because you can be driving and you see this extensive parkland. Um, but it's got some really weird landscaping happening there because what's happened is houses have been demolished Fences have gone, but the domestic landscaping still is there. So it looks quite surreal. You know, a group got together, um, some researchers got together, and there's been a lot of research done in the wake of the, of the Christchurch earthquakes. And this group in particular looked at creating focus groups for 92 leaders that came from six communities within the Canterbury region. And they got them together to say, what, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from what's been happening here about how communities work? And I was really struck with the, the quote that you can read there, and it was actually singled out in the, in the document that I read as well, about the importance of community. But the community has to be something that's already happening. Because even though there's that early phase where everybody pulls together and helps each other, for something that's a bit more long, um, long standing, you have to have really good connections happening within a community. That's what really matters. For me, it was going straight to my family, straight to the people <laughs> who I was connected with. And that's what makes the difference. So sometimes we're media, to, um, and not just media, we all perhaps sometimes think that the real resilience is what happens in the first few days after a crisis. Actually, it's in the long term. When people have f um, family crises, when people have things happening to them, it's not just in the short term. There's often a big response. People have casseroles in their fridge after a death in the family for a while, but then after a while, that, that peters off. So we need to be thinking about more long-term ways of creating support. And that's where I think we need to look at what we think resilience is. I think a lot of people, when you, talk, when you ask, what is resilience? What's it about? Think in terms of mental toughness. So mental toughness there, as you can see, c consists of four characteristics. You can have a flick through, have a think through where, how you stand on some of those characteristics. But resilience is a lot more than just mental toughness. And if you look at this slide, you can see that toughness and recovery skills are merely one characteristic of what resilience incorporates. Resilience incorporates also courage, creativity, so that we can contribute and understand how we can best contribute in communities. But the thing that I want to emphasise today is it also really encompasses connection um, and respect and care for others. Have a look at the list there of a resilient mindset because this should just reinforce some of those things that we've talked about around resilience. This material actually came from some work that was done around building resilient mindsets in children. So we can start quite early when we think about some of these steps. I want to emphasise the last point there. Okay, back to the Lone Ranger. Actually, I, I, I picked the, the first Lone Ranger out of respect for those of you who are old enough to actually remember the first Lone Ranger. And also because when you look at that photo for all the equine students here, who's the real hero? Who's the real hero there? Yes, Silver. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I study leadership and I really enjoy, what I've really enjoyed in studying leadership is to see how every leadership model that comes um, really comes as an antidote to the one that preceded it. It's very interesting. Well, it is to me. I hope it will be for you too. So let me take you through a whistle-stop tour of leadership theories. 
We start and um, we started way back about thinking that leadership was a great man, and yes, I mean it was a great man of leadership, and it was all about the traits that this person would have. So people would refer to as born leaders. They're a born leader. The limitation with that was what? How, how can it be taught? How, how can it be developed if it's just born in some? Who's, who's saying what a born leader is? What, and so they started to turn attention on, well, what, did, what do good leaders do? And so leadership skill became the focus of attention. Then, um, as they were studying leadership skills, they suddenly worked out that some leadership skills work really well in one context, but don't work so well in another context. And so they started to look at the fact that the situation can determine the type of leadership that's going to work best. Then, though, as part of that, they also thought about, well, what is it about the followers that's going to make one variety of leadership more effective than the other? Then they looked at, hey, actually, followers are a part of leadership. Leadership is about a dynamic between a leader and a follower. And then we led to something that we call transactional leadership, which is what we, what we all engage in. That's when a boss says, I'm going to pay you and give you some benefits and give you some resources, but you need to give this work for me. It's transactional leadership. It's what we all engage in. But we needed to look a bit further than that. How can we motivate people that we work with to go the extra mile, to go beyond just a transactional relationship? And that's where transformational leadership came into being, which we'll talk about shortly. I'm going to talk about the other two uh, lines, transformational leadership and also some of those other models shortly. John F. Kennedy back in 1960 actually quoted something that had actually been first said by a French general in the French Revolution, and it was this. There go my people. I must find out where they're going so I can lead them. I wonder what your view is of that view of leadership. I actually think it's quite a postmodern view of leadership because it's, it's saying I can learn from other people and I will let other people's opinions influence where I'm going to go as a leader. But John F. Kennedy back in 1960 actually said, hey, that's not who we want to be. We want to tell people where they need to go. But I'm saying that leadership theories has, have really shifted from that point of view where we say to people, this is where you need to go, to I need to also listen to you so that you can influence me because I'm going to learn from things from you that are going to make me a better leader. Transformational leadership is one of the most researched models of leadership and it is associated with a number of really positive outcomes for organisations and groups and positive um, outcomes in terms of productivity about, around workplace satisfaction as well. And it's got a number of different um, aspects. It has a priority on, a, um, on, a clear, on setting a clear vision. One of the really important sides to it is what they call individualised consideration. And what they mean by that is I, as a leader, understand who my followers are, and I understand what drives them, and I understand how what drives them can be, can be meshed into the vision I have for my workplace and for, or for my mission, for my business. And, and that's where we start to see really leadership starting to incorporate the people that are part of a business or part of an organisation. One of the interesting aspects of transforma transformational leadership was this thing called charisma. It's pretty hard to define, but it's like a charm. It's like an ability to be a brilliant public speaker and to move people. And you, you know what it is when you see it. Unfortunately, it became the thing, the thing that people most wanted to see, and it wasn't always undergirded by a really firm moral compass. And so some of the fallout of businesses within the last two decades have been associated with people that have had extraordinarily large egos and been quite narciss narcissistic in their approach to leadership, who have come into organisations with promises of turning organisations around and bringing in a huge, huge money 
and, and games, only to walk out the door before much longer with much bigger payouts than they really should have been taking, and often leaving their organisations much worse off. And so leadership um, theorists said, OK, this is not enough. Transformational leadership is good. It's, uh, we're finding in research that it's good enough, but we need to deal with what the under, undergirding fibre behind this, the direction that's given to leadership. So you see there that leadership theories have gone from a focus on sort of like a heroic leader, it's all about who the leader is to their skills, to actually understanding who the followers are and how that dynamic works between leaders and followers. It has to be about leadership and connection. So I'm going to talk about three, very, uh, very briefly about three leadership theories that are now out there now, that they're, they're just starting to be researched and looked at very closely by business schools and um, other academic organisations. And also businesses, of course, are really keen. Just read the Harvard, uh, the Harvard Business Review. It's always got some kind of article about leadership. Responsible leadership. If you have a look at that, it notes two, two broad themes. One is around the character behind the person and the other is about their relational intelligence. Relational intelligence, connection. <coughs> the second one is called fifth level leadership and that's characterised by humility, um, the need for not seeking the glory, the ability to accept responsibility for what happens and to admit to mistakes. The story behind fifth level leadership, Jim Collins decided he wanted to research what, what took an organisation that was good, what made it great. So he started with well over, I think, I think around 1,500 organisations and he whittled them down to 11 that he, he thought were, were great organisations. And he found that each of those 11 organisations was led by someone that looked like that, someone who had what he called fifth level leadership. You can see that this kind of leadership was in the face of some of the charismatic, out there leadership styles that had been there before. And it was more self-effacing, but more committed to the good of the organisation. Authentic leadership, they all, do you feel they, they all look quite similar? There is like an ethical element to it and there's a relational element to them and there's certainly integrity built in there as well. Authentic leadership is another one that is really being studied a lot now and again it's a response to leadership that was really going off the rails. It makes you wonder, I often wonder, what's going to be the next big, big thing? What are, what's the mistake that these models are making that the next generation of leadership theories is going to try and fix? The people that, create, that have developed the authentic leadership model say that their leadership model is about a root system that should take place in people's lives so that no matter what leadership approach that you engage in and that you exercise in your families, businesses or communities, you're actually fueled by a root, root system of integrity. I think that's quite, quite interesting and I, I suspect that each of those other three uh, approaches there could be used in a similar vein. Hmm, so I did a, a search, I was thinking, well, what about heroism and leadership, you know, is that, is that still a thing, you know, is, it, is this something that we're still looking at? And I came across um, an article on this person, who, who is this person? Yeah, Ben Robert Smith, VC, okay. And it was actually an article on Ben Robert Smith about his move from being, it was called From Battlefield to Boardroom. So it's about his change in vocation from being where he was into business and what his take was on the kind of leadership that we need in organisations. Ben Robert Smith says that he operates with five key values. I find those really interesting. I find the second one there immensely fascinating, empathy, because I work in a field where I'm training people who are counsellors and coaches. And one of the core things that we teach them is the power of empathy to actually connect with people. This is the one thing that we can actually develop. It is possible to develop empathy. But this is also what Ben had to say about being a leader. 
And as we flick through, I'm hoping that you'll see some of the things that we've been talking about from those leadership models. No one has all the answers. Hey, that's good news for us, those of us who are here today and part of this learning um, community that's Marcus Oldham. It's really interesting that Ben, uh, ben Robert Smith, I've been reading a little bit about him, has also got him behind a lot of um, advocacy in, in terms of return servicemen and women in terms of mental health issues as well. I think it's really great. And he talks about the importance of empathy he says that he considers himself fortunate not to have suffered in the way that many have done, but he sees that it's important to identify with them. So what does this mean for Marcus Oldham? I've been um, talking to Simon and Fiona and some others here from on staff about what that might mean for, for the Marcus Oldham curriculum. I think it's really exciting that you've got a leadership here who are wanting to set a vision that will try and equip all of you fortunate enough, enough to be students here for your future, to be leaders in your businesses and in your communities and to be self-leaders because we need that throughout our lives. And so I know that there are conversations going on, on around what that might look like for the, for, the, for the curriculum. And it could be quite interesting and it might even bring in well, it might even bring in some soft skills. But I'm saying those soft skills will have some hard evidence, and I'm sure they won't make you wear T-shirts saying soft is the new tough. But in fact, some soft skills are tough, and they actually do allow us to connect with people and to create the net networks we need for the extraordinary challenges that, that people face in rural communities. So this man, so we're here today in honour of this man, and I, I had a look at Douglas Boyd, uh, a biography that was online, and I cut, I've cut out this point. I want you to read it, and I want you to tell me what, whether that's a style of leadership that we've talked about today. Where would you put him? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? <laughs> Can you remember what they were? <laughs> I, when I read this, I thought, this man's like a fifth level leader. He's like someone who's perhaps quite shy and maybe self-effacing, but who had a powerful professional role to, to build, who was committed to communities. <coughs> I think the one important thing to take away from what I have to say today here is the myth of the lone hero, the lone ranger, the leader that has it all, who, it's a myth. It's a real myth. And <clears throat> for us to actually uh, survive in today's world, uh, leaders need to have connections. And that's something that you need to bear in mind. Just a nod to the, the more recent version of the lone ranger. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, in my program, I had some time for a couple of questions um, for Annette, if anyone has a question. Yes, Ian. Now, yes, what, let what do you see of the lessons that we can learn from military? I'm thinking of uh, Monash and uh, Pops uh, and the Kokoda Trail. Have you read any of how they operated and uh, do they fit into the modern organisational leadership? I'm sure you could tell me much more about those models. <laughs> I'd like to give you half an hour, but I think Yasmin might kill me for that. <laughs> I don't know so much about that, but the military models have had a huge um, influence over leadership theory, and particularly early on. 
And even now, because, and particularly the US military, because it's such a large organisation, um, it enables lots and lots of research. And so you have a lot of models based on that. But when we, you know, when I put together what I did for today, I went and I'm thinking, I'm not really going in with answers. I, I feel like I'm going in with resources. Because I think really it's up to you. And I think Marcus Oldham in particular has an opportunity here to actually think about what well resilient rural leaders look like. Because we can take the influences that are useful and we can discard those that are not. But I think a, a real opportunity does exist for discussions to take place around that. Any more questions? Up the back from Deb. Can you yell? <laughs> she can. Yeah, she can. <laughs> Well, I think that there'll be phases in common, but I think the timelines of those will differ substantially. And I think you he that there are people here that understand that better. What would you say? too late before attention's paid, yeah. It's, an, it's a really good question, and beyond what I, you know, this is the place to be having this discussion about what we can be doing long term and what indicators and what red flags we need to look at that can signal, signal to us that need for support, yeah. But having said that, I'll also say there's also human tragedy taking place on a smaller scale within communities, within rural families. Um, just, just the normal tragedies that are part of being human that will also invite that response and fade away o over time. Up the back, Tony's got one. You'll have to yell too, Tony. <laughs> It's a really good question, and um, oh, I'd love a lot longer to answer that. But I, I would like to say I think empathy is still possible even when you have to be very decisive. And sometimes being decisive is part of being really empathetic. Um, it, being empathetic is, it doesn't mean that you need to lose your own boundaries. And it doesn't mean that you have to um, become all soft. And It's not sympathy. It's actually being able to see something from someone else's point of view and be able to communicate to that person that you can do that without necessarily agreeing with them or, or changing your own boundaries. And so I actually think empathy is a really strong. I'm not surprised to see Ben Robert Smith coming out and really stating it and being proud of stating it, because I think it's a really strong thing. But I think also what you're saying is there, there, are, there, are, different, there are still different contexts when different leadership styles shine. And that we can't, we can't go totally away from... There are, there are times when a command and control form of leadership, which we often see actually in crises, is very effective and it's still needed. Um, but there are, we also need to broaden our repertoire of leadership approaches to be able to suit and to be able to involve other people more. And that's where leadership theories are going. It's actually recognising we need to connect. Yeah. This will be our last question.
Oh, and, and believe you me, you know, there's a lot of um, arguments back in Christchurch around insurance. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a lot of issues as well. But I think my point is really that the importance of having your connections existing before a disaster happens, whether it's personal or community or rural community-wide, the importance of having connection and the importance that if you're in the role of being a leader and finding ways that you can establish connection with those that you lead. I'm really pleased nobody asked me to predict the cricket score. <laughs> <laughs> that might come next, Annette. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look, we'll, we'll keep on rolling because we're coming up to our... Um, oh, actually, before we do that, let's put our hands together for Annette. Thank you very much.